Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, welcome back everyone for the for the fourth lecture of uh, Alessandro. Okay, thanks, Miguel. So let's let's continue the discussion and hopefully let's get to the, the interesting part. So uh, there is still one little uh, detail that I haven't discussed yet before getting to the interesting part, which is uh, which are the consequences of having a theory which is unitary, or uh, as most of you are, uh, um, are familiar with, uh, is reflection positive. So the, the, the concept of reflection positive uh, has a long history. Uh, reflection positivity has a long history. Uh, this uh, this um, this uh, request was included in the uh, in the reconstruction theory by Osterwalder Schrader in order to prove that the analytic continuation of uh, an Euclidean quantum field theory is actually a, a unitary quantum field theory in Minkowski signature. Uh, it can be uh, it has been nicely um, uh, recollected and reviewed uh, in, a, in a recent paper by uh, Slava and collaborator and it showed that can also be relaxed in a conformance theory to a condition on two point functions only in reflected uh, in, a, in a specific configuration, which is uh, refle reflection positive, reflection symmetric, if you want. Uh, but in the end of the day, it just amounts to say that the states that you that be, that you have constructed and that belong to the, your uh, that make your Hilbert state they have positive norms. Okay. Uh, depending on how you phrase it, this condition uh, assumes various uh, uh, various forms, but it 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 boils down to the fact that whenever you construct a state, um, this state has to be positive norm, okay, uh, where the norm is defined in an appropriate way. And this concept is very familiar even in, uh, in two dimension. For instance, there is this, this the famous example in two dimension. Uh, so let me write the concept. Then. Of unitarity slash reflection positivity. And the, uh, this, the, the condition that you get on, uh, on the reducible representation of the conformal algebra uh, comes from the fact that um, having a unitary uh, theory, having positive norm state. Is not consistent with having any irreducible representation of the conformal algebra. In particular, if you start from a, a primary state of your conformal uh, conformal algebra, and of course you define it to be positive uh, with a positive norm, then the norm of the descendant is fixed by conformal algebra, and, if, and, and you and it can be computed, and uh, you can check whether this, this norm of the descendant is positive or not. And depending on the choice of the quantum numbers of your irreducible representation, it might not be positive. As an example, okay, let's review a very simple case, which generalizes immediately to high dimension. In two dimension, uh, if you take a primary state with conformal weight H and you construct the uh, Virasoro descendant L minus N, and then you um, you take the norm of this, okay, this, you would like this to be positive. Uh, but then you, you start computing, you use the, uh, the algebra of Virasoro, and you discover that the norm of L minus N H is given by uh, a number, which is 2N C, uh, sorry, 2N H plus C over 12 um, N N square minus one, times the norm of H, which as I said, we can pick it, we can pick positive. So and this is positive whenever, of course, if N is large enough, if C is not positive, then eventually this number will become negative. So C has to be positive from this. And if you choose N to be equal to one, you also conclude that H has to be positive. So this is one condition, of course, it's not the most stringent condition. And then by inspecting various descendants and also the, the gram metric of all descendants that have to be semi-definite positive, uh, you end up with the famous CAC determinant. And the theory of uh, reducible Verma model. 
okay, uh, which is well known and uh, leads to a lot of um, structure and a lot of uh, important results into the match. Uh, in D larger than two, there's a similar story, except that now, of course, you cannot use the Virasolo symmetry, but you can use the conformal algebra. And again, the spirit is that if you start from a primary uh, of the conformal algebra, which is po with positive norm, it, it's not guaranteed that all the standards will have positive norm. And uh, so in the end, we'll uh, end up with um, a limit um, on the dimension, uh, this is called unitarity bound, uh, a constraint on the dimension of uh, an irreducible representation that is constrained to, to be larger than a value, which depends on the space-time dimension, of course, and also the irreducible representation R of the, of the rotation. And also you can conclude that the OP coefficient O1, O2, O3, for any uh, O1, O2, O3 are real. Um, which means that the, the, the square of OP coefficient that we encounter encountered in, uh, in the crossing equation is actually a positive number. Uh, just to give you an example of this unitarity bound, to be concrete, in, in, uh, in, in three dimension, which is something that uh, we, are, we are interested to, uh, in three dimension, uh, representations are labeled, uh, a representation of the SO3 are labeled by uh, a in, uh, semi integer J, to J uh, is a, an integer. Then uh, the, uh, these unitarity bounds uh, look uh, very simple. So delta has to be larger than one half in the case of j equal to zero, which means the dimension of a scalar in three dimension has to be larger or equal than the dimension of a free scalar. Uh, similarly goes for, um, and this is not uh, by chance, similarly is for fermion, uh, sorry, for spinor, when j is equal to one half, the dimension has to be larger than one. And then generically for j, larger than one half, uh, the unitarity bound looks simply j larger than, as delta larger than j plus one. And the, if, when the equality is uh, saturated, so when, sorry, when the disequality is saturated, so you have the equality, uh, something very similar to, uh, to the case of two dimension happens. You have shorter multiplets of the conformal, uh, Algebra. And in particular, it means when you saturate one of these bounds, it means that one of the descendants uh, of the primary uh, has a zero norm. So in particular, for instance, in this case, uh, the descendant that becomes of zero norm is the first descendant. Okay. Uh, T mu apply to uh, the primary is zero, a zero norm. And yet you have, it, of course, we have to pick the right descendant, okay? Because when you act with P mu, as we said, you can go in two directions. And uh, for traceless symmetric tensor, you can, you can see that the one that acquires zero norm is the one where you contract the index. So this basically is equivalent to say that this operator becomes a conserved current if a j is an integer. Uh, if it's a spinner, you have to contract in the, in the right way. Uh, for the scalar, which is the case that we, we will interested, uh, will be interest us, uh, the descendant that becomes null is the second one. It's not the first one, but okay, it's a similar story. Okay, and uh, you can generalize this unitarity bound for, for any dimensions and any representation. And there are many, uh, basically all, uh, all cases have been studied um, also with the additional, uh, with presence of supersymmetry and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now that we have 
<clears throat> discuss this last ingredient, we can, in a sense, um, clarify what is a conformal field theory uh, in, the, in, in this approach. The conformal field theory for us is a collection of local operators, if you want, uh, which is equivalent to say collection of correlation functions, parameterized by uh, the quantum numbers of the primary, um, so delta and R uh, that belong to some which we call the spectrum of the theory, together with uh, three-point func uh, three functions among them. For, uh, for any triplet of operators, uh, these three-point functions are parameterized by uh, the three-point function coefficient or OP coefficient, or I, or J, or K, and eventually there is more than one uh, for any triplet. I, J, K. Uh, such that, okay, uh, not any choice of this uh, um, um, of the of spectra and OP coefficients uh, defines a conformal field theory. They have to be uh, first of all they obey unitarity. Okay, so delta is larger or equal than delta uh, unitarity or delta mean, which is a function of delta and R, okay? This is, this is in order to have a unitary CFT. Okay, so let's, let's do unit. But this is not sufficient uh, because as we saw, um, whenever you take a correlation function of four operators, there is this constraint of um, um, crossing symmetry, which is, if you go back to the equation that we wrote, is a constraint on the spectrum and the peak of speech. So it, it, um, uh, it puts together, the crossing equation puts together the spectrum, in, uh, which appears in the sum, and the OP coefficient that appears as OP coefficient square in the case that we uh, discussed, uh, in, in a consistency equation that has to be satisfied. So such that for any correlation uh, four point function or I or J or K and OL that you can write, um, the, cross, the crossing equation are satisfied. For any as I said, for any choice of four operators. So this is an infinite amount of constraints, uh, which of course is uh, it's not tractable uh, at this level. So we have somehow to make it, uh, to simplify this, uh, this condition in order to tackle it. Um, okay, so the question is how do we, which choice of spectra and OP coefficient are uh, defined consistent theory, okay? Um, which choice of, uh, of dimension representations and, and lambdas uh, are consistent with this, uh, with this condition? Uh, so, uh, yes. Alessandro, yeah? I'm sorry, I may have missed it, uh, but did you say that the OP coefficients should satisfy some reality conditions? Yeah, I, I wrote it. Okay. I didn't. I didn't say why, but yeah, I will. Okay. It, okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Sam. Um, right. If, if there is a question, perhaps later we can discuss why this has to be true. But um, yeah, it's a consequence of, of a certain axiom that we can take. But should um, we impose positivity of correlation functions as well? Uh, the positivity of correlation function depends on the operators that you consider. Oh. <clears throat> you can consider operators that are in a reflection positive configuration, and then in that case, this the correlation function has to be uh, uh, positive in a certain sense. Uh, but if you take a random operators that are not in a reflection positive configuration, then it doesn't have to be any one. Um, So the, the idea is uh, 
can we perhaps, de perhaps can we develop question is, the I'm sorry, so perhaps the question was if there's any extra constraints in addition to the ones that you mentioned, which come from requiring that some correlation functions okay. have to in be positive case, where they have to be positive. So in, in that case, um, there is no extra constraint besides this. Particular, for instance, uh, which is not what you were asking, but um, crossing equation of higher, higher point function is guaranteed by this condition. And uh, you can also show that uh, basically once you have uh, required um, positivity of two point functions, then this can be extended to any uh, any state if you want. So any state, any correlation function that can be written as the, the bracket of, of a state with itself, so as a normal square, it will be positive. So there is no extra constraint besides indeed uh, unitarity um, and which, which translates into unitarity bound and the reality of, of, of coefficient and crossing. Then, of course, uh, I, should, I should stress, these are not sufficient conditions to guarantee uh, the existence of the, of the CFT. These are a necessary condition to have a unitary CFT. Uh, there could be, and probably there are, additional conditions that one can, can impose. So for instance, gauge theory are also no local operators, so you can write and, and has to be uh, taken into account eventually. Uh, but we will we will focus on this one. And the idea is to develop a method that allows us to test whether if you take a trial uh, spectrum and of coefficient, and eventually of coefficient, which uh, I think you will you will hear the the, the word CFT data just means uh, spectrum plus of the coefficient. So given such a, a choice of dimension, uh, quantum numbers and OP coefficient, you would like to be able to see, to say whether this choice is consistent at least with a finite number of crossing equations. Okay? And eventually you can increase this finite number and hope that, that will uh, uh, satisfy all crossing conditions. But at least uh, let's um, let's see if we can discuss. Let's see if we can find a method, okay, some a black box that can tell you uh, yes. Is um, sorry, one second. Um, sorry, <clears throat> these things happen remotely. Um, let's see if we can find a method. Okay, some tool that can distinguish between uh, a given spectrum, given choice uh, is inconsistent with uh, a finite number at least of crossing equation and therefore is necessarily ruled out or so far is consistent. So it's consistent with a fi the finite number of crossing equations that you consider And therefore, is in principle allowed. So it's a maybe. Doesn't have to be a real CFT. So with this uh, this logic in mind, let's see if we can hook up a practical algorithm uh, and then apply it to a concrete uh, concrete um, uh, problem. So a practical algorithm could be could go as, as follows. So first of all, uh, since we uh, I, I only discuss scalar, let's assume there is a, at least a scalar in our theory that we would like to discuss, that we like, would like to study. So there is a scalar that I will call sigma with some insight with dimension delta sigma. And of course, it's a scalar, so transforms trivially under um, um, rotation. Then we choose a trial spectrum. Tentative uh, spectrum. 
is in particular amounts to say uh, which operator appear in the OPE sigma sigma, which uh, is the one important if we want to study the correlation function of four identical sigma. As we said before, this will be a sum over delta and L in some spectrum that we chose. So the spectrum we choose, I will call it S. There will be some OP coefficient that we can also choose or not. We can leave it arbitrary. There is a power, uh, x12 to, to some to the appropriate power, and then in the sum there will be operators. Okay, I, I'm not going to be very precise here because we, we don't need we already use the knowledge of OP to write crossing equations. So uh, the only the important uh, information now is which operator here in this sum. And the, the strength with which each operator appear, which are the OP coefficients. Um, so we don't need to specify the spectrum for all the theory, uh, at least at the beginning, because we will focus only on uh, a finite number of correlation functions. And we saw that this correlation function crossing equation involve only certain OP. So we only need to specify those. Um, third point of our uh, algorithm is to consider the correlation function of four sigma, which is identical to four five as before, and the resulting um, crossing equation. So this gives rise by taking the OPE in two different channels two different ways, it gives rise to uh, a condition on the spectrum and the OP coefficient together, which is sum over delta and L in the spectrum that we chose, uh, OP coefficient square that we might, we may or may not choose, um, <clears throat> and then some function that I will call uh, you remember there was this uh, this anti-symmetrization of conformal blocks. I don't I don't want to rewrite it again, so I will just write it delta f delta l. And remember that this f also depends on delta on delta sigma, but I will not write it. And then uh, this is the function of uh, u and v or z z bar or r and eta. Uh, let's call it let's use z z bar, so that we can use the conformal block expression that. Um, I, I wrote in terms of the NC bar. And this has to be equal to zero. Okay. So this is step three. So, so far, so good. Um, now it comes to the interesting part because we would like to check the consistency Consistency of the spectrum S with a crossing equation. So here comes the hard part. How do we do that? Well, one, one convenient way to do that uh, is to look. And then I'll try to explain and to give a, a geometric interpretation of why this is a, an interesting thing to do. But we can look for a linear functional alpha that uh, acts on the space of functions f of this bar. And it has to have some properties. In particular, it has to be it has to be so-called swappable, which means that it has to commute with the OPE. So when we act with, so it has to be true that when I act with alpha to the crossing equation, okay, uh, schematically like this, uh, this has to be equal to the sum of the action. Um, of the function on a single function, on a single term. 
And, and uh, recently, there has been a lot of activity in understanding when this is true and when this is not true. But for the choice of, of linear function that we will make, this will be true. Okay. Um, hopefully, I didn't. Okay. Uh, so it has, it has to have this property. And then, okay, this is very easy to achieve. But then the hard part is that we require that the action of this functional on uh, any function f l um, of the z bar is a positive number, positive real number, except one for any delta and l um, in the spectrum, uh, except one, one case which, for instance, we can take the identity. So delta, delta equals zero, L equals zero, which is the identity operator, which you better include in your uh, spectrum uh, because, of course, it appears in any OP of two identical spheres. For the case, for the identity, instead, we require something uh, stronger. We require that the action of this linear functional on the conformal block of the identity which is um, it's a very simple function. Uh, it's just we can fix it to be a strictly positive number. For instance, we can take it to be one for normalization. And recall that the OP of the identity is actually fixed by the normalization of the field to be one. So this is by, by construction of field. If we, we, we manage to find such a functional, okay, if alpha exists, then you see that this leads to a, con con to a contradiction because you would have uh, the crossing equation acting on the crossing equation. You would get something like lambda square, which is a positive number because the lambdas are positive. Uh, alpha of f delta l uh, let's put some prime where we factorize the contribution of the identity uh, plus one equal to zero but this is a sum of positive uh, terms and so this uh, leads to an inconsistency uh, it means that there is no choice of the lambdas of the op coefficients that allow uh, to satisfy this, this condition. So the spectrum that you have chosen uh, cannot possibly uh, fulfill this crossing equation. Okay, so this of course, if you manage to find alpha. If instead your, your spectrum was a quote unquote a good one, then you won't be able to find uh, such a functional and you cannot conclude anything. So the point now is to find an efficient way to test the existence of such function. Okay, we have to find uh, an efficient way to, to check whether this functional exists or not. Uh, so one set of functional that is proven to be very useful because uh, it's also easy, they're also easy uh, to compute in a sense, uh, is alpha are the following. Of course, as a functional, you can take any any complicated object as long as it's uh, is linear and uh, satisfies this uh, commutation this uh, commutation property with uh, with the OPE. So you can take um, uh, integrals against some kernel as long as, as I said, this property are obeyed. Or you can take evaluation of the conformal block at a given point, or you can take derivatives of the conformal block at a given point. So one useful set of functional that we have been using for quite some time now are labeled by uh, a number lambda, uh, an integer lambda, and it's simply a combination of derivative of the conformal block evaluated at a very convenient point, which is a crossing symmetric point. So it's a sum over M and M with M 
plus n smaller or equal than this uh, parameter lambda. There is a coefficient a m n, and then there are derivatives that can be taken, for instance, with respect to z and respect to z bar, one to the power n, the other one to the power m. And we can also take m smaller or equal than n since, since the conformal blocks are symmetric under exchange. But then you also have to evaluate at some point. And we chose we choose z equals z bar equal one half because if you look carefully, uh, this point is crossing symmetric, is invariant under u exchange with z because u is z z bar and d is one minus z one minus z. So as lambda goes to infinity, so if you take larger and larger, uh, more and more derivatives. This uh, functional, this set of functional is complete, in a sense, uh, parameterize the most general functional, you can say. But uh, practically, uh, if you take lambda finite, uh, this corresponds to take certain number of derivatives of, um, of the conformal blocks, which we have seen uh, can be efficiently computed as rational functions of delta and um, of, of the variable delta and the parameter L. So computing this, uh, this, uh, the action of this uh, um, functional on the conformal blocks is something that can be done very efficiently. Uh, so pictorially, what are we trying to do okay, with this set of functions? Uh, pictorially, uh, we are we're basically taking the first lambda derivative of the crossing equation, okay? And uh, we are writing the crossing equation as, um, as, a sum, uh, as a sum of vectors, uh, lambda squared delta f, let's call it vector, where the, ve the, uh, the vector f is just the vector with, of derivatives. One half, one half. And then you have a uh, derivative of f and delta l evaluated again at one half, one half. So this, this corresponds to take the first lambda derivative of the of the crossing equation. And then you are trying to sum uh, vectors. Now, these are vector in the vector space uh, with positive coefficients. And you're trying to sum them to zero. So there are two, uh, there are two possible uh, situations here. There's a situation in which the vectors, they all lie on half space. With respect to a plane, and the existence of this plane corresponds to the existence of the functional alpha that leaves all the vectors on one side. Okay, so the scalar product of the vector perpendicular to the plane with this vector is positive. Or there is another possibility in which this is not the case. So the vectors are fill the whole space, so you cannot find uh, a plane that leaves them all on the same side. So this, the first case, this, the case on the left, is the, uh, the case in which S is inconsistent. And the other case instead is the, the case in which S is feasible, the feasible spectrum. So, the, the problem is uh, the problem of finding or checking the existence of this functional alpha <clears throat> can be solved by a standard algorithm. In particular, uh, if <clears throat> you can recast this problem into a semi definite uh, programming problem, or uh, if you make some approximation, uh, you can recast it into a simpler linear programming problem which can be solved by standard algorithm and there have been there have been tools developed specifically for the conformal bootstrap 
that you can learn to use in the, in the numerical bootcamp uh, session. But for us, okay, uh, the, main, the main point is that there is a standard, uh, standard way to determine whether uh, alpha lambda, okay, this is a, a functional for a given choice of lambda exists or not. If you find it, then it means that the choice you have made for the spectrum was inconsistent. If you don't find it, uh, it means that, okay, uh, this, this choice is still, uh, um, it's still a good one. Okay, at this point, you can go on your algorithm. In particular, if you find if S is inconsistent, it's consistent, it's feasible, let's say. Then you can choose, uh, you can test another spectrum as prime, which is uh, contained in the previous one. And check it and repeat and you and, re and you can repeat that uh, point four. You can check as prime. If instead uh, you find uh, you found the functional alpha, it means that S was was inconsistent, and then you can repeat by choosing a sec another spectrum, which now is uh, contains S, so it has it's large. And you can repeat four, and eventually you uh, you will uh, determine in the, in the space of spectra that you can possibly think about which one are uh, consistent, which one are not. Okay, now we will see in a, a specific example of how this problem can be carried on. But of course, this is not the end of the story because uh, in this very simple algorithm, we only consider one single correlation function. And we use it to distinguish feasible spectra from unfeasible ones. But you can, you can go beyond, okay? And you can, for instance, increase lambda. So use more general functional. And one important property of how we, do, we parameterize the function is that if you go to a higher lambda, you can only do better. So you can only exclude more things. You cannot do worse. Or, you can add more crossing equations. And again, you can only exclude, ex exclude more because if something is inconsistent with one crossing equation, equation it, won't, uh, in, uh, it won't become consistent if you add another thing. So eventually you can always do better by using more general functionals or using more crossing equations. As you go to, I, to more crossing equations, you have to be careful because for instance, uh, you might lose the positivity of, uh, of equal coefficient square because there might be different of equal feet, product of of equal coefficient that enters. And so you have to adjust for this, but uh, this is not a big deal. You can always reconstruct a positive uh, problem. Positive problem. Um, as you go in, uh, as you increase the, the search space of functional, then eventually you, you hit the, the you hit a numerical problem uh, given by the fact that this takes a lot of time. So there is a trade off. Okay. Um, right. So in the last uh, in the time that I'm that remains, I would like to make to, to study an application of this concrete application. That eventually will be generalized by uh, the, the talk, the lecture by David Poland, to many other uh, physical systems. And the application that I have in mind is the, our celebrated Ising model. And I will start in two dimensions, which is well known. So if you remember, in the, in the first lecture, we, uh, we mentioned a few basic ingredients of the Ising model. In the continuum limit, there was this uh, Z2 symmetry that is important. And we also, uh, we also observed that this, this model contains a Z2 even uh, scalar deformation, which means that there exists an operator that you can add to the theory and it drives you out uh, of the fixed point. It's a scalar 
and it's uh, even under the symmetry, and we call it epsilon, um, which has dimension delta epsilon and spin L equal to zero is a scalar. And the parameter associated to this object is the temperature, okay, the distance from the critical temperature. There is also an odd uh, scalar deformation that you can add to the, uh, the action and also will drive you out of the, of, the, of the fixed point. And then we call it sigma with dimension delta sigma in zero. And the parameter associated to this deformation is the magnetic field. So now we can try to um, play the game that I just discussed, okay? Uh, okay, we, we, we choose, we start by choosing a, a scalar, a sigma, and we also uh, choose a trial spectrum. Uh, in choosing a spectrum, what we have to do, we have to choose um, an OP, okay? So in particular, we have to specify the form of the OP sigma sigma. So now we write NOP in the form of a fusion rule, okay, in a sense. So I will forget about OP coefficient. I will forget about dependence on coordinates. Okay, we'll just write schematically NOP as we write schematically a fusion rule. So there is the identity because this identical scalar. You might say there is, sig no, there is no sigma because uh, sigma is parity is odd under uh, this is the symmetry, so it cannot appear in the OP of two sigma. This is an example of selection rule that we discussed before. Uh, there is epsilon in general. We assume that there is epsilon, this is our choice. Um, and of course, there is no reason why it shouldn't, because it, this time is an even, is even under this Z2 symmetry. And then, of course, there are other scalars. With them, and I assume that all other scalars have dimension delta larger or equal than delta epsilon. So epsilon, in a sense, is defined to be the smaller scalar in the game, in this OP. And then uh, there are other, uh, there are no scalars operator, um, which I do not specify anything about. So the only thing that I know about this is that they satisfy unitarity, so delta would be larger than delta unitarity, which for this case uh, is um, uh, L, okay, for any L. <clears throat> so this is a spectrum of uh, even operators, and incidentally, it's the same that, uh, that appear in the epsilon epsilon of E, okay, again, there will be the identity, there won't be any sigma, there will be epsilon. And again, I can assume the same thing. Okay. Two OP runs over the same spectrum, which I call S plus. And eventually I could, I could make, uh, I, could, I could specify also the spectrum that appears in OP sigma with epsilon. Now there is no identity because uh, these, two point, these two objects do not have a two-point function. Uh, there is no epsilon, okay, because this object is, um, so there is no identity. There is sigma, there is no epsilon, because again, epsilon is, uh, is even while the product sigma times epsilon is uh, odd under the Z2 symmetry. And then there are uh, scalars, with dimension delta larger than delta sigma and non scalars. And again, uh, the non scalars satisfy delta larger or equal to delta unitary. Okay, these are my assumptions on, the, the, my, uh, on my spectra. Then uh, the second point of our algorithm was to choose, or well, the next point of our algorithm was to choose a four point function. So next. We choose uh, the four point function of sigma, for instance. And this leads to a crossing equation that we wrote as sum over delta and L in the spectrum plus lambda squared delta L 
function f delta f of z z bar equal to z. At this point, okay, for, a, for any, you see that uh, the, our spectra and our crossing equation is parameterized by two numbers in a sense, delta sigma and delta f. These are two numbers that I have to uniquely that I have to specify in order to um, make this uh, this spectra a, a bit more concrete. And I don't want to make any other assumptions. So all the assumptions that I'm making are listed there, together with unitarity, okay, and and crossing sigma. So at this point, the next point in our algorithm was to check the consistency of the spectrum. And I can do this by varying uh, these two parameters, delta sigma and delta f. So for any delta sigma and delta epsilon, I can check whether this the spectrum that I obtain uh, is consistent with crossing or not. And we will find a loud region or disallowed region. Why do I expect to find this loud region in this, in the, with this choice of spectrum? Well, definitely there are theories that are consistent with this, uh, this assumption and I will list now a, a bunch. So for at least for those theories, uh, the, um, this point, this, this, for those values of delta sigma and delta epsilon, uh, the spectrum has to be consistent. And by continuity, since I'm truncating the number of uh, theories, sorry, the number of, cross, of crossing equation, and also for a given crossing equation, I'm considering uh, only a finite set of, uh, fi um, a subset of all possible uh, functionals, I expect that each neighborhood of uh, an existing CFT will also be allowed. And this will perhaps create an allowed region, an extended allowed region. Vice versa, why do I expect this allowed region? Well, I expect this allowed region because eventually by making the spectrum too small, by making the set S plus and S minus very small, the positivity properties of, uh, of the conformal blocks and the, and the OP coefficient will make it very hard to fulfill this equation. So in general, in general I expect to have, uh, let's say, a point which is allowed, perhaps a point here is allowed. But I also expect to have, uh, um, I also know that there are points in this space, in this plane that exist. In particular, um, the assumptions that I made are consistent with, uh, 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 sorry, uh, the assumption that we made are consistent with many theories. In particular, for instance, particular, for instance, the minimal models have a structure very similar to the one that I discussed. Okay, minimal model. If you remember the uh, fusion rule of the field one, two with itself, okay? This one, will con uh, if you look at the, the structure of the fusion rule, this will contain phi one, one, which is the identity. Well, the identity and all its zeros are descendant, so the stress tensor and many others, but the smallest operator is the identity. And then there is also phi one, three, with all its zeros or descendants, which we can interpret as epsilon. Um, and so if we if we restrict ourselves to the correlation function of sigma uh, identified with phi one two, uh, this is what the only thing that matters. And it has precisely the structure uh, that we, we are imposing. Uh, and you can check that at least for small values of delta sigma, delta epsilon. These are indeed, uh, epsilon and sigma are indeed the smallest um, operators, okay? And uh, the dimension of this object, uh, HRS, 
it can, uh, can be computed exactly. And they look like something like this, m plus one, um, r minus m s square minus one divided by four m m plus one, where m is uh, given by the central charge, one minus six divided by m m plus one, if I remember correctly, which give us, as m is larger or equal than three, uh, it gives us a line of points that starts uh, some value, which is, uh, so remember the delta sigma is related to h by twice. So it starts at one eight and one. This is the Ising model. And then it goes up to, so there are many points and goes up to, it goes in a straight line up to one, uh, sorry, one, one half two. You go somewhere. So all these points should be in the, should end up in the loud region if our method is, uh, works per, um, um, works. On top of this, there are other theories. Okay, for instance, there is the, the vertex uh, operator algebra, which is basically exponential of three fields. They have uh, uh, also um, an OPE, which is very similar to the one uh, that I described. So, Vu alpha, Vu alpha basically uh, gives you uh, one plus Vu uh, V to alpha. And the dimension of Vu alpha now, delta V alpha, is uh, alpha square over two. So the dimension of two alpha is four, is four times this, uh, which mean, which gives us a line, a continuous line of uh, theories that starts from the origin and goes uh, um, towards the same point, one, four, uh, two. So all these theories should end up in the loud region. And then if you start playing um, the game that I did just discuss, so for any choice of delta sigma and delta epsilon, you discover that uh, you can create a, a really a, a boundary between the allowed region and the disallowed region, for instance, by bisecting in a certain direction. And this boundary looks something like this. So it starts, uh, well, it probably starts a little bit more tangent to this line. Uh, I apologize for my drawing skills. And then it grows rapidly, reaches the Ising model, and then continues as a straight line touching uh, on top of the, of the minimal model. The allowed region is the region below this blue line, while in the region outside, there are no CSPs. Meaning that for this choice, of delta sigma and delta epsilon, the simple assumption that I made that epsilon is the smallest dimension operator is not consistent already with a single crossing equation. Um, in this, uh, one thing that it's worth noticing is that in this uh, otherwise smooth uh, blue line, there is uh, a feature, this continuity if you want, which usually is referred as a king in the bootstrap community. And uh, it's uh, in correspondence uh, of the Eisen model and very precise is the location of this kink, especially in two dimensions, very, very, very close to the Eisen model. Um, so this, this gives us the hope uh, that by uh, doing a similar game in other contexts, you will be able to uh, spot, for instance, the presence of a CFT and this will be signaled by discontinuity in the boundary between the disallowed and the allowed region. And the important, the important point of this, uh, this picture is that I didn't use at all the Virasoro symmetry. I just used Virasoro symmetry to, to draw the, this, uh, this point, the point of allowed, or the allowed point, the red point, but I didn't use it uh, to draw or to distinguish between the disallowed and the, and the allowed region. So this method can be extended immediately to a higher dimension. 
and it has been done for, for the three-dimensionalizing model. And the picture is similar. There is, um, um, I can draw it for you. You can do exactly the same game with exactly the same assumption. You end up with a picture like this in three dimensions. Um, now the line of theories uh, has a slope of two, uh, delta epsilon equal to delta sigma. Uh, these are theories that are known to exist in any dimension. They're called generalized three theories. And then, uh, and then of course, they will be inside the allowed region. But then, on top of this, uh, the, the boundary of the between the allowed region and the disallowed region looks something like this. Grows almost linearly. Then it changes slope. We go goes almost parallel to this line. Uh, and the allowed region again is inside. And again, there is a kink. And if you look where this kink is, the location is in correspondence of the predicted position of the Ising model in 3D by epsilon expansion of Monte Carlo. Of course, you can say, okay, but this uh, is just a kink. It's no, there is no way you can determine um, the critical exponent, for instance, of the Ising model by just looking at this picture. And that's of course true. But so far, I, uh, I, I remind you that we only be using uh, the correlation function of four identical operators, with, which gives you access to the OP sigma sigma. If instead you supplement this, the crossing equation that comes from this with other crossing equation, in particular, you add the mixed sigma epsilon and epsilon 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 correlation function, which give you give you access to uh, epsilon epsilon and sigma epsilon OP. And on top of this, okay, you make a very uh, physical assumption that is um, delta uh, sorry, sigma and epsilon are the only uh, scalar operator, at least in these OPEs, that are with dimensions smaller than three, so they are relevant. Then, as I said, the, more, the stronger the assumption, the smaller will be the uh, loud region or the larger will be the disallowed region. And you, you manage to shrink this allowed region to a, a small, closed, disconnected from anything else region, where, which is the only place where your CFT uh, consistent with your assumption uh, can live. Um, of course, we don't prove that it exists. We only restrict the, pla the, the place where it can live. Uh, just to give you uh, a sense of how small is this island, because from, my, because, uh, from this picture, it looks very, very large. But as I said, you can always increase the search space of functional. You can, uh, you can use more powerful computers. Okay, and just to give you a sense, uh, the, mo the most precise determination of delta sigma and delta epsilon looks something like this. And then I will conclude. So this is 0 0.5181489 with the last two digits uh, of uncertainty. And when I say uncertainty, I mean that uh, delta sigma has to live in a box uh, with, this, with plus or minus the last number. So the I can give you the central number plus or minus the two extremes. And delta epsilon instead uh, is 1.41265. Um, 
and again 10. So delta sigma and delta epsilon must live in this box. These are not statistical errors, okay? Uh, the, the, the must, uh, in fact, the region is actually smaller than this, but just to quote some error. Okay, uh, I think I'll stop here because I'm running out of time. I hope I gave you a flavor of uh, how the numerical boosts work and that uh, it has been success successfully applied to the IV model, to many other models, as you will hear uh, later this week. And uh, it's, the, it's on very solid ground. And uh, hopefully we will find a way to uh, we will find a synergy with uh, with other fields, in particular uh, statistical uh, physics, uh, with all the experts present in this conference. Thank you very much. All right. Let's uh, thank Alessandro for these very nice uh, lectures. So we have time for uh, for questions. Hi, I'm Francesco Parisian from the University of Wurzburg. Um, I have a um, a question on the on the kind of answers you make. So in principle, you have a <clears throat> uh, an infinite set of irrelevant operators, no? But you right. you just you just pick up uh, when you write the OPE, you just uh, truncate the sum to some. Uh, set of operators so i wonder whether this truncation has an impact in the is still rigorous or if so uh, very good uh, so we are not truncating the op okay I'm, I'm just saying that the op contain in this particular the last particular example i'm specifying the value of two relevant operators right and then i'm allowing for any other possible irrelevant scalar with any dimension and any other non-scalar operator so i'm not restricting i'm not truncating the op Okay, I'm just saying everything else is irrelevant. Right, but then you have an infinite of these vectors f. Uh, Correct. Right. So if you, so the point is, uh, there is a way to to take into account the fact that there is a, an infinite one by, uh, in a sense. So the point is, uh, with the approximation of the conformal block that I gave you, the positivity of this functional applied to a conformal block is trans translated to a positivity of a rational function, um, which has a, a positive denominator. So it's actually a positivity of a polynomial for any value of delta above a certain value. And this is exactly what a semi-definite problem can, can solve. So the problem has been translated to a positivity of polynomial with, with a variable that goes from a minimal value to infinity. Mm -hmm. So there is no approximate and then there is also another thing that you that perhaps can help you is that these conformal blocks go rapidly to their asymptotic form. So eventually you could even forget about the tails and just put yes. the value, which is what has been done in the past, and it worked uh, as nicely. In fact, for the spin, uh, for the, the parameter, there's also there would be a double truncation in delta and in the spin. For the spin, that's what we do. We replace, we truncate the, the, the number of spins and we replace it with some symptotic form because conformal blocks converge pretty rapidly. And also there is another thing, um, the contribution of a given irreducible representation is exponentially suppressed with dimension to the contribution to a four point function. So eventually they don't even matter too much. Yeah, I see. Okay, thank you. May I ask a question? Uh, sure. uh, can you, in principle at least, uh, adopt your method uh, for the computation of subtler things like the scaling function? For example, in two dimensional easing, maybe the most interesting information would be to include also magnetic field to go slightly out of the critical point and then you know, uh, that there is a scaling, there is a scaling, universal scaling function, which in right. principle should no, be so somehow related to the, to the structure constants, etc. Is it possible to modify the method for? Right, so you can do conformal perturbation theory around a fixed point, uh, but once you know, once you know enough about the fixed point, all the scaling dimension and all the coefficients, 
you can start perturbing the theory and you create a flow. And then there are corrections. There are corrections to scaling. There are corrections. You know, that there is a better function that you can compute. So as long as you, you manage to express, which is the hard part, as long as you manage to express uh, your favorite observable in terms of CFT data, then uh, you, you can do that. Uh, but how, how efficient it is in practice, for example, uh, for two-dimensional right. easing, where this function is not known uh, uh, theoretically? Uh, it's efficient, but not too much, in the sense that it's very hard to, do, to go to a higher order in this perturbation theory, because mm -hmm. eventually uh, going to higher order in, involves knowing higher end correlation functions, which are hard to compute. So it's not very fit. Well, it's, it's doable in principle, if you know enough about the theory, but it's hard in, in practice. And also universal, I, I sincerely, I don't know how to relate general is a universal, universal ratios to OP coefficients. Um, it's not an easy problem to do. It can be done in, in particular cases, but uh, no, it's, it's a hard problem. Mm. Thank you. And maybe I can add a comment here because th there is a, a, a nice work by Michele Caselle and, um, right. uh, and other people from Turin who studied precisely this problem. They studied the uh, of critical, uh, they studied of critical easing, and uh, we're, we're uh, uh, just trying to describe an experimental data. And uh, in their work, they reached very high accuracy, and for them, it was very important to have access to all this uh, conformal perturbation theory data and uh, uh, and the P coefficients provided by the bootstrap. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, uh, I think it's the best work for right. critical easing in three dimensions, and it relied very importantly on this conformal bootstrap results. Mm -hmm. I can send the reference later on Slack. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. But this is the, the perturbation theory. Essentially, you gather the information from conformal bootstrap to... Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. they got the information from various sources, and okay, conformal bootstrap was just one uh, part of insight uh, in that study, uh, but it was an important insight. There are other insights. I forget exactly what uh, other insights. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Can I also ask another question about of critical easing while we're at it? Sure. So in 2D, uh, we know very well that uh, sigma and epsilon uh, will uh, lead to a gapped phase, what, uh, how, uh, regardless of what parameters we choose to deform by. Is, it, is this known in 3D that uh, one cannot reach another fixed point by leaving the 3 d in? Yeah, I mean, this is a well-studied problem. It amounts to study the phases of five to the four when you add mass deformation or... Um, yeah, you, you reach, I mean, it's, it's well studied. In fact, recently, uh, there have been also other approaches to study non perturbably like Hamilton and Trocation. Um, and yeah, story is it's very similar so we, with some difference, of course. Um, I don't know, we, perhaps we can discuss later if you want. I, I, can, I can send you references. But yeah, it's a it's very similar problem. I mean, if you add the mass, it uh, depends on the sign of the mass, you might, you might have symmetry breaking or not. Um, the st it's a standard uh, problem in quantum field theory, if you want. Debate, yeah. Uh, there are May I ask a question? Sure. I'm Silva Ribot. So in uh, the case of the easing model, so you assume you have, you can have, a lot of uh, operators of dimension more than three. And you don't really specify what they are, but you can control their contributions, basically. And the question is, uh, is unitarity really necessary for that? Or could you still control their contributions just based on their conformal dimension if you didn't have this uh, unitarity assumption? Right, okay. Uh, so, the, um, the fact that, for instance, large dimension operator are exponentially suppressed is, a, is something you can prove using unitarity. 
Uh, if you don't use unitarity, I don't think you can prove such a thing. Such a thing. Um, then, okay, you might argue the same happens um, for some reason, um, but it's not, I mean, there is no proof of that. Uh, that not that I'm aware of. Um, perhaps, okay, there are, there are uh, alternative approaches to the one that I described. Okay, in particular, there's something which is called uh, the analytic bootstrap or like con bootstrap, uh, which has developed um, uh, a formalism to uh, compute, for instance, OP coefficients starting from a correlation function. And most importantly, uh, it can show the existence of uh, key towers of operators. Uh, and compute their OP coefficient, their dimension in the limit of, of large spin. Now, the, the, at the leading order, this operator behaves like uh, they have a universal behavior. So those will, will, will behave the same way. Uh, but we, we don't know about the others, okay? We cannot, we cannot control everything else if you don't have unitarity. Because if you have unitarity, you can, in a sense, bound the behavior of the tape using uh, Standard theorems, uh, um, in, in, uh, uh, standard mathematical in, 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 yeah, theory of, of functions. Uh, but if you don't have unitarity, then I don't think this is possible. So you, you know something, you can know something about the operators, but you can know, you cannot be sure that uh, nothing goes wrong for other operators, for instance. Now, I, I sincerely, I don't know of any example where this is not true, but perhaps uh, in principle, it can be done. It, it, it's still possible, it's still plausible. Okay, thank you. And also I, I should mention that we are, we are uh, what the exponential suppression and uh, this, uh, this behavior is really asymptotic, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't hold for operator of dimension 10, for instance. Uh, so it's not that you can control everything about uh, irrelevant operators. You can control it in the asymptotic behavior, but in the intermediate regime, you don't really know what's going on a priori. No, but you still can control them in the sense that you can, you yeah, can there is a bound. an argument saying that they don't matter somehow, that you can derive sure, bounds there's a, there's independently of what they do. So, so somehow you can control them. Somehow, yeah. But well, there is an upper bound, but it gets uh, shallower and shallower as you decrease the match. Now, which upper bound? Your upper bound. I mean, but there are many bounds. But look at this result uh, that you just explained: the the the, the bound, the determination of delta sigma and delta epsilon. The fact that you are able to derive this bound without saying anything about what the relevant operators where they are and so on, it means that you control them in some sense. Oh, sure. Yeah. That's true, but this, this, uh, this bound would change if you, instead of uh, assuming that everything is irrelevant, you assume that everything is, uh, I don't know, larger than 3.5. I mean, as you, as you approach the real dimension of the operator, uh, the bound becomes dependent on that. Maybe I, I mean going back to Sylvain's comment. I mean, even though you don't, we don't have unitarity, we still have crossing. So, I guess you're saying perhaps uh, this can still be used to to say something about the contribution of these tails, because it's true that they cannot do something completely arbitrary because they have to reproduce um, the the high the, the, the behavior of the high dimension operator is controlled by what happens in the cross channel. Right. So even without unitarity. So yeah. they are more free, but they're still uh, these OP coefficients. They can't be too crazy. Yeah, this I agree, but I don't think there is a precise proof of that. Mm. So on average, we know that they still have to behave as if they were unitary, right? On average. Because they have to reproduce the same power law. Well, but that's that holds for the leading power. Then, if you go to subleading one, um, for sure. 
anyway, yeah. I mean, the understanding is that probably nothing, intuition is that probably nothing crazy happens. Um, but then uh, if you have unitarity, everything is more under control. You can probably turn this discussion around and say that, okay, uh, if somebody can come up with a reasonable set of assumptions about non-unitary theories, uh, which may not be fully rigorous, but still allow to perform some computations, well, that would be a welcome development. The point is that we don't even know, you know, on the one hand, this should be sufficiently general assumptions that they allow many theories. On the other hand, they should allow to perform some computations and those assumptions are not, uh, are not available, unfortunately. Open problem. More questions for Alessandro? Yeah, sorry, I have one. Uh, what is in 3D at the boundary between the allowed and not allowed region? So there is something like the minimal models in 2D? Right, that, that's a very good question. Um, first of all, um, uh, well, there, there is no known CFT that lives on, uh, on, this, uh, on this blue line. And also, uh, Sorry, there's, a, there's the n I equals think. one. There's the n equals one uh, uh, supersymmetric pleasing model, right? The, uh, does it live on the boundary? Uh, I think the claim, yes. I thought it was. I think boundary. the claim is that it's slightly beyond the boundary because there's some weakly relevant guy. Yeah. yeah. I think we see exactly on the boundary. Yeah. It's a, okay. Thanks, Neil. Uh, okay. Right. So perhaps there is one point which is uh, on the boundary, but then there is uh, no other known CFT that, that lives there. Um, and if you start adding correlation function, you and adding assumptions, you will uh, you will discover that this uh, part of this line at least is uh, it becomes disallowed. Um, so yeah, but there is no known, uh, there is no, there is no explanation so far of the shape of this bond. So it's like uh, if this line is more an artifact of the fact that you use uh, only one uh, equation in 3D somehow. Right. It's a line of, solu of a solution of crossing, of this crossing equation um, that, um, may or may not extend to other correlation functions, depending on the assumption. Thank you. How important is the assumption of this uh, data smaller than three here? So these are very drop this or the These more are crucial. Space is bigger? The region is bigger? Uh, I didn't hear the last part of the question, the, of the question, but- so If you drop uh, the constraint delta smaller than three for the scalars, does this okay, great. become uh, bigger? Right, so if you, if you don't do this assumption and you stick to the assumption that we had before, nothing changes in the sense that you go back to the, to the blue region, the, the blue extended region. So if you don't, if you drop, if you drop this, Okay, uh, if you remove this, then the region still is this one. Uh, there, is no, there is no island, there is no disconnected island. And the reason is basically uh, that you're not uh, using properly the combined system of equations. It's like anyone, each one of them didn't talk to the other. Um, only when, so you can, People have explored different assumptions, of course. If you assume that, for instance, uh, this, this delta, um, if you assume that only epsilon is the, uh, the relevant, the unique or relevant operator in this, in this channel, then you, you carve out a little bit, but you're not able to create a, a closed region. It's really when you 
assume that also sigma is isolated and all the other are irrelevant if you create this, uh, uh, this region. There are other choices of assumption that can create an island. Okay, this is not the only one. It's the one that is more, it's easier to justify physically because it has a, a physical meaning. But you can cook up other assumptions. Uh, for instance, there was a paper by Ming Su where uh, they, they used a gap in the, after the, the, the stress tensor. So assumption on other operator of spin two, and they were still able to create an island. Of course, that one is less, uh, less physically reasonable uh, or, or less easy to justify, but still is an assumption that, that, that allows you to create an island. So you can play with assumptions and uh, they, are all, they all have different uh, impacts. But in this case, this, this is crucial. Okay, thank if you, you relax it, you, you lose the, 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 the closed region. So in particular, in three dimensions, you don't find anything like a tricritical leasing model? So um, that's, that's the n equals one the solution we mentioned. No, no, no. Oh, OK. That's that's the it's not the yeah. same as n equals one in 3D. The tricritical is trivial in 3D, and the n equals one is non-trivial. Right. Uh, okay. There are other models that have been studied with similar things. There is a, indeed the n equal one. There is um, the yeah. ON model that are not in this plot. Uh, <laughs> People try to, to see whether they, they could find a plot model. Yeah, it's a bit noisy. Yeah, uh, it's because I, yeah. I'm still wanting to say something. So uh, there are some claims, uh, numerical claims, that the Ashkin Teller model has non trivial critical points in three dimensions. Is that something that you looked into? Isn't that impossible? The Ashkin Teller model is equal to four parts model. Can you, perhaps we switch off the, the microphone. Um, that's definitely something that can be addressed with the, I mean, the existence of, more in general, the existence of critical points is a very, very well suited question for the bootstrap. Uh, you, of course, you have to supplement the question with a, a certain set of assumptions, in particular, from this, from this analysis, it looks very important, the uh, selection rules in the OP, meaning what, is, what are the uh, global symmetries and also what are the, the number of relevant operators. So definitely you can address this question if, uh, and the starting point would be to uh, understand this set of information. To show if I answer the question. There is a parallel discussion going on here with another participant without the microphone, sorry. Uh, but yeah, thanks for the answer. Okay, so I suggest that we thank Alessandro once again for the ver this very nice series of lectures and for answering all our questions. So thanks a lot, Alessandro. Pleasure.